Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of SCON Res 25. The clerk will report. SCON Res 25, providing for a correction in the enrollment of H.R. 2872. Without objection, proceed to the measure. To the measure. Madam President, I further ask that the concurrent resolution be agreed to and the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, as they have for 50 years now, in rain and cold, in sunshine and snow, pro-life Americans will take to the streets of Washington, D.C. tomorrow to march for life. They come by the tens of thousands from all across the country, in buses, in cars, and on planes. Young people, so many young people, and Americans of every age from every walk of life. They come to Washington, D.C. for a simple reason, to testify to the truth enshrined in our declaration that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among those are the right to life, to liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that that right to life applies to every person, not just those the pro-abortion movement thinks should be allowed to be born, every person, born and unborn. Madam President, at some level, I think everyone knows the truth of what abortion is, killing of an innocent human being. The pro-abortion movement and the Democrat Party, unfortunately one and the same these days, have tried to obscure this truth. They do everything they can to avoid talking about the reality of the issue. But I think even they are well aware that when we're talking about abortion, we're talking about the killing of a human being. I think they are well aware that a seven-pound unborn baby is just as human and just as worthy of life as a seven-pound baby who's already been born. But although I think everyone knows the reality of the issue, it can be easy to ignore or forget the fact that every year in this country, hundreds of thousands of babies are being killed by abortion. And when I say hundreds of thousands, I mean hundreds of thousands. The pro-abortion Guttmacher Institute reports that, and I quote, in the first 10 months of 2023, there were an estimated 878,000 abortions in the formal U.S. health care system, end quote. 878,000. To put that number in perspective, 878,000 is more than the entire population of some U.S. states. That is a lot of lives lost, Madam President. A lot of love lost. And we cannot afford to forget that this is happening. And every year, the March for Life provides us with a powerful reminder. Madam President, the March for Life is a vast assembly of pro-lifers and, as I said, a powerful witness. And it's just one facet of the pro-life movement. An even bigger work, an even bigger focus, I might add, of the pro-life movement is offering hope and help to moms in need. And that goes on every day in every state around the country at pregnancy resource centers, at maternity homes where moms have access to the resources they need to care for their babies and to get on their feet, at churches, on college campuses, and in many other places. Supporting moms and babies is what the pro-life movement does. And it's what it will continue to do no matter how many obstacles are placed in its way. Madam President, I'm committed to doing everything I can in Washington to protect babies and support the work of the pro-life movement, whether that's opposing pro-abortion rules from the administration or working to advance legislation like my Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, which would require that babies born alive during a botched abortion be granted the same medical care as any other baby would be. And I'm grateful 
to all of my colleagues who stand up for life here in Congress and to the countless Americans who spend each day standing up for moms and their babies. And today I want to especially thank all of those who will march through the streets of Washington tomorrow to remind us all of the reality of abortion and the importance of defending the right to life. Madam President, given the grim reality of abortion, it will be no surprise if the mood at the March for Life each year were somber. But I am always struck by the hope and enthusiasm that emanates from so many of the marchers, especially the young people. And I think, Madam President, it's because the marchers know that no matter how long and how hard the battle, that at the end of the day, life will win. I firmly believe that, Madam President, and I look forward to the day when we fully live up to our founding principles and ensure that the right to life of every American, born and unborn, is respected. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Oklahoma. Madam President, it's January. It's cold outside. In fact, it's snowing outside here in Washington, D.C. today and tomorrow. It's late January, which means what it has meant for the last five decades. Pro-life Americans will gather by the hundreds of thousands in Washington, D.C. and will converge on this city to say we think every child is valuable. Now, I have to tell you, every march that I've been to, and I've been to a lot, they're all cold. They don't all have snow. This one will. I bet it won't dampen the spirits for a lot of students and leaders and moms and dads, little ones that'll come, just to be able to say, hey, we're an American, and we think life is valuable. We think children are precious. We think this is an important issue. Now, it hasn't all, we haven't always had a March for Life. We've had one for 50 years, actually. But it's interestingly enough, when Nellie Gray and some other pro-life leaders organized the March for Life starting after 1973, after the Roe v. Wade decision, they were recognizing an anomaly in American law. Because our nation's been a nation almost 250 years. But abortion was only mandated in every state and every place just during that short time period under Roe v. Wade. For the other two centuries of our nation, this issue about the value of life was decided in every state and among the people. That's what's occurred again. We still have abortion in America. It's happening all over the country. But individuals are rising up and saying, our state, our leaders, and even this Congress needs to have a conversation about when is a child a child? And when does a child become valuable in our culture and when is a child disposable in our culture? And which child can be disposed of and which child is celebrated? I, I love this side-by-side -side picture here, and I don't know if you can really see it, but this is an ultrasound that's actually happening in the womb with this baby in this position with arms up over her head, and then a baby sleeps like that. In fact, both of my daughters, they often slept like that. We called them touchdown position on that when their hands were raised up over their head. But it's kind of funny for me to be able to see this picture and to be able to see an ultrasound of this child in the womb sleeping just like the same way they would later sleep in the crib. You know why? Because there's no difference between these two babies. That's a baby then, and that's a baby then. The only difference is time. The only difference between myself right now and myself nine months ago was time, nine months of time. The only difference between this child in the womb and that child laying in the crib is just a little bit of time. And there are literally millions of Americans that have this very simple perspective that we should, as the march says this year, we should march with every woman for every child. That we should stand up for those individuals and to be able to honor those families. We march in support of pregnancy research, uh, resource centers. Those folks who are 
walking with women through very difficult decisions and through very hard moments. There was a recent study that was done on pregnancy resource centers done just in 2022 that found that $359 million were donated to individuals through pregnancy resource centers all over the country. Those are diapers and wipes, those are baby formula, that's car seats, that's free ultrasounds, that's free pregnancy tests, that's after abortion support, and sometimes it's strollers and clothes. The vast majority of those individuals that work in these pregnancy resource centers are, are heroes, they're volunteers, they give their time, they've got full-time jobs or tasks or families in other places, but they value every single child, even the children they don't know enough that they would donate their time and their money and their effort just to be able to say that child is just as valuable as that child. And then in America, we shouldn't pick and choose which child is precious and which child is disposable. We should just say they all are. This administration has been exceptionally aggressive on taking on this issue of life, pushing back from the very beginning. For instance, there's a nurse that was in the process of, of dealing with her employer because this nurse had informed the hospital that she worked with that she was personally opposed to abortion, morally personally opposed to abortion. And she was told, you won't have to participate in abortion. You have a conscience right protection that's under the United States law that individuals can't be compelled to have an abortion. So she worked at this hospital until one day she had a doctor and a nurse that actually compelled her to participate in an abortion or she would lose her job. She was not allowed to be able to have her conscience without losing her job. Well, that was in the course of litigation, but in the earliest days of the Biden administration, that litigation was just dismissed, saying to her, we understand it's federal law that you should have conscience protections, but we don't agree with your opinion, and so you don't get conscience protections only people we agree with. That's wrong. In my state, funding from this administration was cut off in my state for AIDS testing, for screenings, breast cancer evaluations. That money was federal dollars allocated to my state to help in healthcare in rural communities. That money was cut off by this administration you want to know why? Because our state would not promote abortion. And the determination was made, you won't get federal assistance for AIDS testing or for breast cancer screening or for assistance in your county health departments. We're going to cut your funds off for that if your state chooses not to promote abortion. And our state stepped up and said, we believe every child is valuable, both of those kids. And we'll find a way to do it on our own. But in the meantime, this administration is cutting off funds for AIDS testing because they don't like people in our state, our opinion about the value of life. This administration has just proposed to cut off temporary assistance for needy families to pro-life centers. As I mentioned before, some of these pregnancy resource centers give out food, clothing, assistance. They've been a part of the TANF program for years and years and years. But this administration has proposed to be able to cut them off, to say, if you assist families but also don't promote abortion, you can't actually assist families. You're not one of us. Literally telling to those Americans, you don't agree with the administration, so you don't count. Because you're actually trying to protect life. We won't help you do that. This administration is currently trying to use the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act to force doctors to provide abortions, even though that law that they're using specifically and explicitly protects pregnant moms and unborn children. But they're currently trying to be able to twist it the other way. This administration is currently fighting an issue on chemical abortions. Chemical abortions that have been around for years. A two-drug cocktail that the first drug actually disconnects the child from the connection in the womb and starves them. The second pill causes that delivery, causes the contraction of the uterus, and they have an abortion at home, a do-it-yourself kit for at home. That for years has been a very specific issue, only a certain specific time period. 
that you could actually use that drug cocktail, knowing that if the child was just a few weeks older, it causes a real danger to the mom. Or if this was an eptopic pregnancy, it could actually take the life of that mom. Or if the mom has the wrong blood type, it could actually cause the mom not to be able to have children in the future. So in the past, a physician would have to connect with that mom before they would get this drug cocktail. This administration has continued to fight to say, no, they don't need to see a physician. They can just get it mailed to them. And in a situation with an eptopic pregnancy, literally the side effects from having the do-it-yourself abortion at home may look similar to the side effects of an eptopic pregnancy, but there's no way to know unless you get that ultrasound, and they'll never know. Listen, I'm, I'm fully aware this administration's aggressive about trying to provide more abortions in the country. But why would they put women's lives at risk to be able to make it more convenient to be able to have an abortion? It's January. So we're talking about this issue of abortion because the March for Life is happening. But there are literally millions of Americans all around the country that they're gonna to continue to be able to talk about this issue of life in every way that they can. Because they look at these two children, literally a few weeks apart, and they think both of them are valuable. And I don't think that's a radical concept. We live in a culture in America that is committed to tolerance, acceptance, and diversity. But it seems to be so except for every area except for that child. That child doesn't get to have tolerance, acceptance, and be welcomed into a culture. That child is sometimes determined to be disposable. And I wanna to say to the millions of Americans that see both these kids and both think they're valuable, continue to be able to love people, to be able to walk alongside those moms, to be able to encourage in every way that you can. Because as a culture, as we keep talking about this issue, more and more people will look at these two pictures and will say, you're right, they both look like children to me. Why don't we treat them equal? That's what we should be all about as a country, and that's why we march in every cold January. With that, I yield the floor.